to where we are going to head in the near future. From there, let's go back into history, ladies and gentlemen, and we come to the Indian Army in Italy during the World War II. The Indian Army during the Second World War was the largest volunteer army ever seen by the world. It served with distinction in major theaters of war like North Africa, Italy, and Burma. Italy was a tough campaign on account of terrain and weather, as well as the tough and determined foe, that is the German army. In the face of such odds, the Indian army served with distinction and fought in some of the fierce, fiercest battles of World War II, like crossing of the Sangro River and the Battle of Monte Cassino. The 4th, 8th, and the 10th Indian divisions, along with the 43rd Independent Gurkha Infantry Brigade, fought with great valor as a part of the British 8th Army. On the panel today, we have Dr. Alexander Wilson. Dr. Wilson teaches military history at the Defense Studies Department, King's College, London. He is Regional Director of the Second World War Research Group with, the resp with responsibility for Europe, the Middle East, and North, North Africa. A counselor of the Army Records Society and a member of the Jalandhar Brigade Association. His research focuses on the Indian Army in the Second World War and has taken him to battlefields from Italy to Myanmar and the archives in the UK, India, and Nepal. Gareth Davis served in the Royal Tank Regiment with operational tours in the Middle East and two staff tours in the Ministry of Defense. He has also been the faculty at Sandhurst the Land Warfare School, and the Joint Services Command and Staff College. Gareth now works as a warfare analyst and looking at the current military challenges as well as helping people learn from the past. His first book, Tanks, in 1917, will be published by Helion in 2022. Professor Niall Barr is Professor of Military History and Head of Department at the Defence Studies Department, King's College, London. He has taught at, at St. Andrew, Andrews and the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. He joined the Staff College in 2000, where he teaches on a wide range of military courses, including the Higher Command and Staff Course, and conducts numerous battlefield tours and staff rides. His main research interest concerns the Anglo-American Alliance in the Second World War, but he also has an enduring interest in the Scottish military tradition. His current research pro pro uh, project concerns the role and importance of food in war. His books include Flodden, 1513, Pendulum of War, and Yanks and Lines. Colonel Patrick Messer. By his own confession, he is obsessed with military history. He served in the army for 25 years, mostly in the North Island, Uganda, and Bosnia, before he became the defense correspondent for BBC Radio Forces, today's program, and subsequently a member of parliament. Widely traveled over many British Army's most dramatic battlefields, he is credited with being the first Briton to return to the Crimean battlefields in 1993. Mercer specializes in the Seven Years and Napoleon, Napoleonic Wars, colonial warfare, Crimean campaign, the Indian mutiny, Irish rebellions, and the Italian campaign of 1943-45. Moderating the panel today is Dr. Robert Lyman. Dr. Lyman is an elected fellow at the Royal Historical Society. The primary focus of his research is the British and Commonwealth uh, are the British and Commonwealth armies in the Second World War. He served for 20 years in the British Army. He is currently writing an account of the Burma campaign. In his book, he argues that this campaign was a victory for India and the Indian Army and served as a key validation for a newly independent India. Over to you, uh, Dr. Lyman. Well, the only person we don't have in the panel this morning is Niall Barr, and I'm assuming that uh, our organizers will ensure that he's, uh, he's he joins us uh, as soon as we can. But uh, I'll just let all my fellow panelists uh, be aware of that in case Alex you'll be you might be stepping off on your own <laughs> well, it's a really really great pleasure for me to be able to um, in introduce everyone today and to be able to uh, act as the moderator um, it's going to be a scintillating session and a very warm welcome to everyone from around the globe particularly those in Chandigarh who will be uh, watching us online and uh, let me say we're looking forward to being back with you next year in person 
Well, many of you listening will know that I believe our lack of knowledge about the role of the Indian Army in the Second World War is a national disgrace. And that's not just in the UK, but in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh as well. And the history of the pre-partition Indian Army is a fundamental part of our history and a significant cornerstone in the story of independence in 1947. It's a story of dramatic change, and we'll hear a little bit about that this morning. A transmogrification, uh, if you will, of the armies that transited from something in 1939 to something very, very different in 1943 and 44 and 45, an army that was able to take on industrialized enemies in a way that had not been conceived of before the Second World War. In a sense, it was a story also of remarkable success, not just against the Japanese, but against the most determined of foes in North Africa and Italy as well. And that's the subject of this morning's conversation. And it's a real pleasure for me this morning to put a little bit of spot, a little spotlight on a little known battlefield for the Indian Army, which is Italy from 1943. And uh, we've already had introduced to us uh, our panelists who will be uh, taking us through the German minefields on the Gothic line. Uh, it doesn't look as though uh, Neil Barr is able to join us at the moment. There have been technical difficulties over the last few hours with getting uh, Professor Neil on online. So I think what we'll do is we'll start off uh, by asking uh, Dr. Alex Wilson to introduce us to uh, his subject, which is to spend a little bit of time uh, understanding how it was that the Indian Army made that transition from a pre-war colonial or even mercenary army in 1939 to, to an army that was able to take on the Germans on pretty much equal terms in 1943. So, Alex, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Rob, for that most generous introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me? Wonderful, I'll begin. And thank you, too, to our organisers for all their hard work behind the scenes. I'm delighted to be supporting the Chandigarh Military Literature Festival because Chandigarh is a city very close to my heart. I first went there 10 years ago, and I'd love to be there today, but um, this is the next best thing. By the 8th of May 1945, there were 96,100 Indian soldiers serving with Central Mediterranean forces in Italy and Greece, filling, as the announcer mentioned, Three divisions composed of a mixture of British and Indian troops, as well as an independent Gurkha brigade. And these formations fought at the forefront of the Allied campaign in Italy from October 1943 with the crossings of the Bithano and Truno rivers in the lower Adriatic front, right up to the final battles to break into the Po Valley. And the significance of this contribution wasn't lost on contemporaries. As a British warrant officer assigned to the 10th Indian Division, remarked in a letter which he wrote home during January 1945, ever since we came to Italy, we've been in the thick of the fighting. And he added, everybody seems to depend a devil of a lot on the Indian divisions. This contribution is perhaps not as forgotten as some might like to contend. After all, it does feature prominently in almost all mainstream histories of the Italian campaign, alongside of the other national contingents, but as Dr. Rob Lyman hinted at, there remains scope to develop our detailed understanding of aspects of this experience. Foremost of all, how the Indian divisions in Italy fitted into the Indian Army's wider program of wartime change. And it's this which forms the focus of this paper. I'm going to ask two linked questions which connect contribution in Italy to this broader story of transformation. I'll start with a broad question how the Indian Army adapted to the general requirement of waging a world war during the 1940s. Then I'll move on to a more specific question, how the Indian formations which were sent to Italy adapted to the specific operational and tactical requirements of that campaign. Now, if we take those two questions together, the answers help us to come closer to a more evaluative pattern on how the Indian Army mobilized for the Italian campaign. So to start with the process of wartime mobilization, we need to talk about the Indian Army's vast expansion, which saw the force undergrow growth, which took it from just under 200,000 all ranks in 1939 to over 2 million soldiers 
by the end of the war in 1945, and this provided the mass to fight on multiple fronts. Important to bear in mind that during the time of the Italian campaign, um, Libyan troops comprised the bulk of 14th Army in Burma, but also fulfilled large-scale internal security roles in the Middle East and India itself. So we need to talk about expansion in order to understand how this was possible. And the expansion process was achieved in two principal ways. First, the army expanded openings to Indian subjects to hold the King's Commission. This is known as the Indianization process. And um, the second process was through broadening the criteria against which ordinary Jawans were admitted into the ranks. Uh, and this enables people from marginalized social groups or from regions in India, such as South India, which had typically been underrepresented um, to serve the war effort. To start with the Indianization process, um, it originated during the interwar period, but previous initiatives to Indianize the army uh, were designed to proceed slowly and were also bedeviled by petty acts of discrimination and resistance to change. Now, the literature on organizational change highlights the need for shocks or jolts to spur institutions to make change, to transform. And in many ways, the Second World War provided a shock to the Indian Army. Thus, we see the overall number of Indian officers holding the King's Commission growing from just 577 in 1939 to over 15,000 by the end of the war. And set against this, the proportion of British officers to Indian officers declines from 10 to 1 down to 4 to 1. Now, some frictions were made, but many senior British officers recognized that combat effectiveness depended upon mutual cooperation. And so a lot of the pre-war barriers were broken down. And by the time of the Italian campaign, the army had gone a long way to reducing antagonism within units and to ensuring identical conditions of service, um, shared medical arrangements, and eventually parity and pay. With this broader talent pool, this meant that the Indian divisions in Italy were able to draw on the services of numerous highly proficient Indian officers to hold command and staff appointments. Many commanded companies in the rank of captain and major, and a few led battalions either formally towards the end of the campaign, or in some cases stepping up to command their units in action. And to give you an example of this, Major Gidari Singh of the 3rd Eighth Punjab Regiment stepped up to command his battalion in the successful crossing of the Gari River during mid-May 1944. And whilst total parity still remained a fair distance away, closer cooperation had been attained, and this process augmented Indian Division's fighting power. With regards to the broadening of representation in the army in the lower ranks, the pre-war army tended to recruit overwhelmingly from northern and northwest India and Nepal, but the wartime demand for recruits and the scale of losses rendered this unsustainable by 1943. So the army responded by enlisting hundreds of thousands of Jawans from parts of India which had previously been underrepresented, including the South, or from lower cl classes in society. But within this transformation lurk a number of uncomfortable truths and indeed, as Stephen Wilkinson, C. Christine Fair, who spoke here at the event last year, and Amanda Chisholm's work goes to show, colonial era inequalities persist to an extent in successor institutions to this day. But with regards to the Second World War, while some of the new enlistees fought in frontline units in Burma, the majority tended to be directed to administrative, logistical or construction roles in particular, building and running rear base infrastructure in eastern India and the Middle East. While most of the fighting continued to be done by troops from northern and northwest India and Nepal, and you'll find Punjabis comprise around 50% of Indian forces in Italy, out of relation to the proportion of the population as a whole. But that said, these distinctions were inconsistently applied. So we do find South Indian soldiers such as Subhadar Subramanian playing key roles in the Italian campaign, and other lower, lower caste personnel like Baz Mir, who was formerly a Dobie and um, a follower, gaining competent status and distinction, in his case, during the casino fighting of March 1944. And combined, these initiatives enabled Indian units in Italy 
to maintain an average troop strength consistently above that of the British units serving alongside them, which faced a manpower crisis by the summer of 1944 onward, but also consistently stronger um, in numbers than the German units arrayed against them. The second theme of this paper moves from looking at the expansion to looking at how the expanded army learned to fight. Um, because the Indian Army's defeats in Southeast Asia, in Singapore, Malaya, and Burma from late 1941 through to early 1943 showed, um, expansion was only the first part of mobilization. And the second part involved providing the skill set and the mindset required to fight effectively. So the Indian Army's overall focus from 1943 to 1945 lay in preparing the troops for jungle warfare, as um, Dr. Rob Lyman mentioned in the introduction. But the institution also took seriously the need to fit formations to fight in Italy. So training for the Italian campaign began in India. And we see by the 1st of April 1944 that there were 73,220 soldiers at training units in India dedicated to preparing them to serve in Italy, the Middle East, or Africa. And if you analyze the numbers and the turnover of troops in theater, the vast majority were bound for Italy. In terms of training in the theater itself, high command in India devolved much of the responsibility for training to the Indian divisions already in the Mediterranean and the Middle East, because their focus was on preparing the Indian army for operations in Burma. So this gives rise to a decentralized approach to learning, which placed a great deal of responsibility upon individual divisional and brigade commanders. Although the Indian divisions rarely served side by side during the Italian campaign, much less within a dedicated Indian corps or higher formation, they developed an impressive though informal horizontal approach to sharing the lessons of combat, where divisions with the most recent experience sought to share their knowledge with those preparing to enter or re-enter the fray. The specific substance of training for the Italian campaign focused on tactics for major combat operations, including mountain warfare, river crossings, and urban operations, as the groups found they had to contend with numerous defended towns and villages. But they also took into account low-level patrolling and raiding, which formed a huge part of the troops' um, experience when not committed to the, the major offensives. But training also focused on imparting specific skills needed to operate effectively uh, in the Italian terrain, and these included rock climbing and skiing. The training also consisted of equipping troops with the mindset to operate effectively. And um, to give you an anecdote about how this works, the troops were encouraged to display initiative in training as well as on the battlefield. So a foot patrol of the Central India horse was cut off in snowy conditions by a German ski patrol in the Maela Mountains during the spring of 1944. But rather than surrender, um, the troops um, repurposed their jackets as toboggans and sledged to safety, um, escaping the German forces and returning to 4th Indian Division with their Hall of Intelligence. Um, the focus was also on adopting new weapons and technologies, but I'll leave that part to Gareth, who's going to talk about the divisional cavalry regiments and their mechanization process. Um, but it's important to bear in mind that um, the operations also involved um, working with amphibious vehicles, um, landing craft, and the like for the many river crossings over the course of the campaign. To evaluate the role that training played in operational success, we should concede that training did not alone guarantee operational success because combat um, comprises a fundamentally adversarial pursuit. Uh, unit quality has to be considered in the contexts of wider support from the allied field armies around the Indian divisions, the toughness of the tasks to which they were assigned, as well as resistance from the enemies set against them. So we see even experienced or well-trained formations and units like 4th Indian Division at Casino could be halted. However, training did prove essential for fitting the Indian divisions to the distinctive challenges to be found in the Italian campaign. Um, so to conclude, by the spring of 1945, 8th and 10th Indian Divisions and 43rd Gurkha Lorry Brigades were involved in successful Allied operations to break out into the Po Valley in the north of Italy. 
Um, these operations broke German resistance in the theater, leading to the German surrender in Italy on the 2nd of May, a week before Germany's formal surrender and the end of active hostilities in Europe. But this victory came at a price. Battle casualties for the free Indian divisions are estimated at 473 officers and 6,967 other ranks. But this paper's explored how the Indian Army made this contribution possible. Expansion provided the mass upon which global mobilization depended and ensured that the Indian Army sustained their four divisions in Italy with adequate numbers of personnel. The second theme addresses the ways in which the Indian divisions adapted to the rigors of the Italian campaign itself. And combined, these measures enabled the Indian Army to adapt to waging a world war and gave Indian divisions the key to operating effectively. That Indian formations were able to play such a meaningful role in this campaign owed in no small part to their army's remarkable wartime transformation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alex. What a fabulous start. And it's quite extraordinary, isn't it, to think about the, the way in which the Indian army had to expand in numerical terms, whilst at the same time learning how to fight a, a, new, uh, a new way of war fighting against an industrialized enemy and a pretty potent one at that, uh, and to retain its morale all the way through. So we're, we're very, that was, that was a fabulous start. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're delighted, of course, that uh, Professor Neil Barr's managed to join us. Those technical problems have, uh, have been resolved. So uh, a very warm welcome to Professor Barr. We'll hand over to you now really to explain why on earth the Indian Army was in Italy at all in 1943 and to provide some sort of strategic context for, for the war. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Robert. Uh, I'm I'm going to uh, attempt to share my screen now. But before I before I do, uh, I'd just like to uh, say it's a, a pleasure and a privilege to uh, be invited to take part in uh, in this panel and uh, in the literary festival. Um, so I will now attempt to uh, share my screen um, and uh, see if I can show you some of my um, slides that I would like to show you. Uh, let me see. No, I'm not able to. Ah, well, I might be able to if I do this. Um, here we go. Can people see that? No. Not present. Uh, in which case I may... Ah, ah, wait a minute. Yes, I think it will work uh, if I do this. Can you see it now? Nope. It may take a moment as well. There we are. Perfect. There we are. Very good. Good. Um, so I, I'm going to go back a slide, first of all. Uh, in, in many respects, uh, my theme uh, for this talk is, is sunny Italy. Uh, and the fact that the expectations uh, of a rapid and successful campaign uh, proved uh, to be completely uh, un unfounded. Uh, this is a, a cartoon of, of the two types, uh, the two types uh, from the cartoonist John of the Eighth Army. Uh, these gentlemen had fought through uh, the whole of the North African campaign uh, and through into Italy, as indeed many uh, of the Indian troops uh, involved in the campaign had done so. Um, this map, uh, which in many respects is the most important of my maps, um, would give anyone the impression reading a book with this kind of map in it, uh, that the campaign in Italy was somehow uh, a triumphant uh, onward uh, uh, progression uh, and that it had been planned as such uh, from the very beginning. Uh, and of course, uh, nothing could be further from this, the truth. So sometimes maps can give us uh, a sense of ine inevitability, uh, which didn't exist uh, at the time. Uh, and as Alex has already mentioned, uh, there were uh, at least three Indian divisions and an independent brigade uh, that fight through this extremely hard fought campaign uh, from December 1943 uh, until the end of the war in uh, April 1945. So what I want to do is just explain how this is not an inevitable campaign uh, and how the conditions are in fact very different, uh, very difficult indeed. Uh, this map uh, is, in a sense, designed to simply show the fact that uh, allied arguments uh, as to how to progress the war in Europe 
uh, continued throughout the conflict. Uh, and that by 1943, um, the British and American high commands uh, were still arguing uh, as to the best approach uh, for how to bring the war in Europe to uh, a conclusion. Now, those arguments and controversies uh, are very heated, uh, and I simply don't have time to, to delve into them in, in any depth. But simply the fact that there are so many different plans uh, gives you an impression uh, as to the kind of arguments uh, that rage. Ultimately, uh, with the successful conclusion uh, of the campaign uh, in French North Africa, uh, which itself uh, uh, had, uh, had caused a huge amount of controversy, ultimately the Allies do decide that they will invade the island of Sicily in an operation known uh, as Operation Husky. Uh, General George Marshall, the uh, Chief of Staff of the US Army, um, had not wanted to uh, mount a campaign against Sicily, uh, he saw the entire operation in the Mediterranean, not only as a British-fired uh, campaign, uh, but uh, as one which acted as a vacuum pump, sucking American strength away from where it really ought to be, uh, which was for an immediate cross-channel against France, uh, cross-channel attack against France, uh, against the German-occupied France. Um, and with the successful conclusion of the Sicily campaign, uh, which actually led to uh, the toppling of Mussolini uh, as the leader of Italy, it was quite clear that Italy was uh, on the verge of leaving the war. Uh, but at the same time, uh, at the Quadrant Conference, uh, the Allies had decided that the main force uh, and the main attention now needed to be turned against the cross-channel attack uh, for France. Roundup became uh, renamed as Operation Overlord. And that meant that any attack or any assault on the Italian mainland was now no longer going to be the main focus of Allied attention. It was going to be a strictly limited liability campaign with strictly limited resources. And when we consider uh, the very large coastline that Italy has, one of the key questions which everyone always asks about the Italian campaign is why was not more use made of amphibious assaults to lever the Germans uh, out of uh, positions. And of course, the answer is that the amphibious capability of the Allies uh, was focused upon the campaign in France uh, and the limited resources uh, given to the Italian campaign, still very considerable, particularly in modern terms, uh, made amphibious assaults uh, almost uh, impossible with one notable exception. So when the Allies consider uh, where this limited liability campaign is to be mounted uh, against the um, uh, against Italy, um, you can, again you can see from the huge range of plans developed uh, that uh, while military forces do always have to have contingency plans, uh, it's quite clear that the Allies didn't really have a, a, a clear focus uh, for this campaign. Uh, they weren't really clear on how this campaign should be launched uh, or indeed how it should be conducted. Um, eventually, they narrowed down to just three main operations. Uh, Operation Avalanche uh, against the Bay of Salerno, uh, basically as far north as Allied air cover uh, from Sicily will enable. Uh, and the Eighth Army uh, was to be inserted into Italy through Baytown and Slapstick. Uh, and it's actually as a result of slapstick that the integrations uh, first enter the Italian campaign uh, through the port uh, of Taranto. Uh, one of the most important expectations that the Allies have is that with Italy on the verge of surrender, uh, the negotiations for an armistice are going, uh, going on, uh, is that the Germans will not fight for Italy that they will, in fact, uh, withdraw from southern Italy uh, and defend on the Alps. And it's very clear by this phased approach that by uh, landing in September, uh, that by the 30th of November, effectively, Italy will be clear of German troops. That is the Allied expectation. Uh, but of course, the expectation does not become the reality. Uh, instead, as the convoys uh, sail towards Salerno, news of the Italian armistice uh, is uh, broadcast to the men in, the, in these ships. 
uh, with the troops believing that perhaps, just perhaps, uh, they will be greeted uh, by the Italians uh, as liberators and that there will be no fighting. Um, of course, the reality uh, is very different. Uh, and the German forces that fight around Salerno and delay Eighth Army in their progress from southern Italy, uh, it becomes clear that those expectations uh, are soon to be dashed. Um, instead, the Allied troops through October to December 1943 find that the Germans uh, defend almost uh, every hilltop, every mountainside, uh, and that conditions in Italy uh, are by no means those that they had expected. Uh, this next slide, in many respects, sums up the reality. Uh, Bill Malden, uh, the uh, famous cartoonist uh, who, in a sense, uh, charted the uh, American experience in the campaign, uh, this damn tree leaks uh, is very much the ordinary soldier's view of the campaign. Italy proves to be cold, wet, uh, frosty, uh, and filled with hilltop villages uh, and mountain ridges, uh, which the Germans uh, tenaciously defend. Uh, almost every hilltop, every mountain has to be taken uh, individually, and that slows the Allied progress uh, dramatically. Um, now, one of the Allied uh, strategic objectives of the campaign in Italy is to contain German troops uh, in Italy to keep them away from uh, the assault uh, that will be coming across the channel. But as the Germans uh, begin to grudgingly give ground, uh, it becomes clear that one of the key strategic questions, which in many respects has never been answered about this campaign, um, is who was containing who? Uh, because the Germans uh, are very skillful in defence, uh, very grudging in giving up ground, and it takes a huge amount uh, of effort uh, to push them back. Nonetheless, from Salerno, uh, through the liberation of Naples, the Allies do progress through the winter of 1943 in dreadful conditions. Uh, but what none of the Allied planners really uh, understood was that the Germans were planning to make their main stand on what became known as the Gustav. Uh, and the location which is circled there in red uh, is the town and monastery of Casino, uh, and a very, very difficult position uh, to break through. Uh, and of course, it's the battles for Monte Casino which uh, involve Indian troops uh, over many months. It's the battles for Monte Cassino that, in uh, in many respects, are the one event of this campaign uh, which is remembered. Uh, the battles for Monte Cassino ultimately form a campaign in themselves uh, and in the total destruction of the Benedict Benedictine Monastery uh, and uh, the town of Monte Cassino uh, in battles which more re resemble the First World War than those uh, of uh, the Second World War. Um, now, in the interests of time, I, I will briefly mention uh, those battles, uh, the uh, the Rapido crossing, uh, which what forms the centerpiece of the first battle with the uh, US 36 Texan uh, division suffering terrible losses. But it would be quite wrong of me not to mention uh, in uh, the second battle, uh, the fact that the 4th Indian Division uh, had taken positions on the Casino Massif uh, in very difficult conditions, rock sangers, uh, where uh, there was absolutely no cover. And it's to support their attack uh, on this, the 17th uh, of February uh, that the monastery is bombed. Uh, Francis Chuker, the commander of the 4th Indian, Indian Division, requests the bombing of the monastery. Um, but uh, communications between the air and the ground uh, are quite frankly woeful. The monastery is bombed two days before uh, the 4th Indian Division uh, is ready to attack. Uh, and when it does attack, uh, they suffer very heavy casualties. So the endurance of the 4th, 6th Rajputana rifles uh, up on the Casino Massif uh, have become part of the legend of, of the Battle of Monte Cassino. And in the third battle uh, of Monte Cassino, again, it would be quite wrong of me not to mention the 1st, 9th uh, Gurkhas, who managed to reach Hangman's Hill halfway up uh, the Casino Monastery Hill and hang on there uh, for nine days uh, in what is uh, an epic uh, of uh, endurance. 
Ultimately, the monastery is captured after the fourth battle uh, of Casino, and the way to Rome is finally open. Um, but the campaign in Italy gains, uh, gains its moment in the sun for just one day uh, when Mark Clark uh, enters Rome on the 5th of June 1944, uh, one day before uh, the long-awaited cross-channel attack. Uh, Clark later uh, complained that uh, they had only given him the headlines uh, for one day. And of course, in, in Britain, uh, one of the myths of the entire war, which stings many of the troops in Italy, is that uh, it, a rumour goes round that the troops in Italy have been called D-Day Dodgers, perhaps by the MP Nancy Astor, perhaps not. Uh, and John produces this uh, cartoon, uh, and there is a famous uh, D-Day Dodgers. The Indian troops involved in this campaign uh, uh, absolutely have the right to call themselves D-Day Dodgers uh, as well, having fought, particularly in the 4th Indian Division, all the way from Karen uh, to, through to uh, Casino. Um, and unfortunately, uh, both at the time and ever since, uh, the focus did switch to the campaign in Northwest Europe, uh, and the, the troops in Italy uh, felt that their efforts, particularly after Monte Cassino, uh, were always in the shade. Uh, that is an unfortunate historical fact, uh, which we should do everything we can to avoid. Uh, the campaign be uh, continues beyond Rome in a pursuit uh, with the 8th and 10th Indian divisions uh, fighting uh, intensively and highly successfully uh, in the, the Tuscan hills uh, and mountains uh, on the drive to Florence. Uh, it's worth pausing to note that by late 1944, these are multinational armies uh, in Italy, uh, comprising of all of these nationalities, uh, and in, indeed until uh, the summer of 1944, including French troops as well. So the Allied armies in Italy, in many respects, form a, a model that has become very familiar uh, in operations since, which is multinational, uh, multinational armies uh, operating uh, together. Uh, the Allies attempt to gatecrash the next major uh, German defence line, the Gothic line, and Indian troops, uh, as, as you could see from the last slide, uh, fight in both the US uh, 5th Army and the British 8th Army on the Adriatic coast. Unfortunately, those efforts are unsuccessful, um, and it means that the Allied armies have to spend yet another winter uh, in the Italian mountains. Uh, this is a period where Allied desertion rates rise, uh, where Italian partisans fight a very bitter war behind the lines. Uh, and it's also a war uh, of rivers, mud and engineers, uh, making very uh, slow progress in very difficult winter conditions. So it's not until the new year of 1945 that the Allies in Italy are able to uh, um, prepare another offensive. And 4th Indian Division, uh, which has toured across uh, the Mediterranean by now, uh, is sent to uh, Greece uh, to, support, uh, to support the government there against a communist, uh, a, a communist uprising. It's not then until uh, April 1945, uh, when the Allied armies in Italy finally uh, break through, uh, that German resistance in, in Italy uh, is shattered. And the Indian formations play a notable part in that, uh, as uh, Alex uh, has already mentioned. Uh, and so the war in Italy actually comes to an end uh, just a few days before the rest of the war uh, in Italy, uh, in the, the rest of the war in Europe. Uh, it brings to an end uh, Italian fascism uh, and plays a major part, uh, not only in containing uh, German troops, uh, but in uh, liberating Italy finally. Um, so just a few concluding comments. Uh, the war in Italy, uh, often uh, overlooked even at the time, uh, has faded uh, generally from uh, public memory. Um, the war in Italy was indeed a hard way to make war, uh, imposing uh, real demands upon the troops 
that took part in it of endurance uh, and cover uh, and courage. Um, and uh, as we can see from this Sikh soldier uh, holding up a, a captured German flag uh, at the end of the war, uh, of course, these Indian troops uh, played a major part uh, in the European campaign uh, to liberate Europe uh, from fascism. Uh, but of course, at this point, uh, India itself was not independent. Uh, and that raises questions uh, about their, uh, their, their role uh, and uh, about uh, um, uh, what happens next. But ultimately, over 50,000 Indian troops fight in the Italian campaign uh, in very difficult conditions, uh, and they fight uh, extremely well uh, and with real uh, courage. Uh, and it's in that context that we should remember that courage and sacrifice uh, as we uh, consider the Italian campaign today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Neil. That was a fabulous introduction to the to the campaign, and uh, it just bears out again, doesn't it? The, um, the the quite extraordinary challenges that faced the the very young Indian Army as it transformed itself um, from what it had been before to what it was now asked to do in pursuit of Allied war aims in a major theatre of war, the European theatre of operations. Uh, and it's, uh, it's it's good just to pause and to consider just how dramatic those changes were. So from a deployable division, the 4th Indian Division in 1939, remember the Indian Army existed essentially to support and backfill the British Army in operations globally. It was an imperial reserve to fighting in that context in North Africa, then being put on those ships and sent to Italy and finding that the challenges that it was faced were very different to what it had assumed. And Alex at the start had explained very clearly just why it was that the Indian Army was able to transform it. So I think it's be useful now, and we've, we've heard a little bit about how the Indian Army was uh, challenged by the fighting around Mon Monte Cassino, and it had learned to fight in a very, very different way to the the waste uh, the waste of North Africa. Uh, and then it fought um, valiantly and learned to change its tactics again in the pursuit to, to Florence. Uh, and then, of course, we have this uh, th this this terrible challenge of. Um, as, as, as Neil Barr described it, gate crashing the Gothic line. So what I'm going to ask now is for Colonel Patrick Mercer to talk to us a little bit about the challenges that the Indians found on the Gothic line and how they dealt with those challenges one by one in order to re retain the uh, mastery of the battlefield. That's one most important point, but actually to retain the morale that the Indian armies were now significantly renowned for. So Patrick, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Rob. Um, first of all, can I can I ask, have I got uh, someone to put my slides on? If I haven't, it doesn't matter in the slightest bit because I can talk without them. I can't do that myself. Do you happen to know? Right, doesn't matter in the slightest bit then. Uh, Patrick, I was just going to say that if, if they may if they may come up if someone in the, in the background can put them on. Okay. Back, we'll be able to do it for you. Thank you very much indeed. That's no problem. Um, thank you very much to Niall Barr um, and, the, and to Alex before him, who spoke before him. I'm going to try and take this in a wholly unacademic way, if I may, from the grand strategic and the political strategic aspect right the way down to the personal one. Why can I do that? Well, I, I suspect that I am unique amongst you. Perhaps I'm wrong in saying that I'm, I'm the son, not just of a D-Day dodger, but also of a casino dodger. So even if you know anything about the Italian campaign, oh. as Niall has just pointed out, um, casino tends to dominate. Uh, that, that's a subject of another, another conversation completely. But my dear old dad found himself in one of the least glamorous but hardest fighting battalions of the British Army, 14th Battalion of the Sherwood Foresters, who had fought their way through the uh, through the campaign in the desert, had taken very heavy casualties at Alamein, and then found themselves thrust into what they thought was going to be sunny Italy, but missing completely the casino front and actually fighting at Anzio. Now, after Anzio, the, the great thing about 14th Forest is that they were a, a motor battalion, and therefore they belonged to the fable, the very famous British First Armoured Division. And after Casino, after the Gustav line had fallen, after Rome had been taken, 
this gang of uh, Midland Englishmen found themselves back in their brain gun carriers, back in their lorries, alongside the tanks of the Second Armoured Brigade, working under the command of uh, the later Field Marshal Sir Richard Hull as the commander of the First Armoured Division, and heading up to that much neglected, as we've just heard, that much neglected part of the Italian campaign, namely the fighting up on the Gothic line in northeast Italy. Now, I, I, may, I may contend one or two of the comments that have already been made about how successful or otherwise this fighting was. But what they very quickly found was that if we take the First Armoured Division, that this consisted of a powerful brigade of tanks with a little bit of organic infantry, and then a weak infantry, lorried infantry brigade, namely 18 lorried infantry brigade, consisting of three English infantry battalions. But this was wholly inadequate for dealing with the very, very difficult fighting that they were about to face up just south of San Marino in from the coast of Ancona. They didn't simply have enough infantry to support the tanks that they were needed, that were needed. So after Alamein, after Anzio, this very knocked about and experienced battalion were suddenly told, do you know what, chaps, you are going to be reinforced. And it's not just being reinforced with any old organization, but 43 lorried infantry Gurkha brigade are going to be put inside the first armored division. And more importantly, your left <laughs> flank is going to be secured by the fourth Indian Infantry Division. Now, again, uh, talking to my father, talking to his old comrades, I, I had the great good fortune to interview many of these old boys in the 60s, no longer well, the 70s, really, 70s and the 80s, when as a young officer I was on leave. They talk about being absolutely electrified. They, they weren't going to have guardsmen or riflemen or buffs or loyals or any of the organizations that they knew, but suddenly they were going to have Rajputana rifles. They were going to have Central India horse. They were going to have Sikh battalions and Gurkha battalions. Suddenly these great glamorous names were being put up in front of them. And it seemed to them that after the miseries of Anzio, that after the difficulties, the initial fighting on the, on the Gothic line, <clears throat> that these hardy little hillmen, these magnificent mustachioed and turbaned Sikhs and the like, we're going to be there to support them and to be able to break through the Germans who had blunted my father's battalion on several occasions beforehand. Now, turning then from the, uh, the fighting down on the Gustav line up to the northern part of the Italian campaign, as Dr. Neil Barr has made quite clear, this is the, the ultimate part of the campaign. And we're concentrating now in September 1944 through to October before the dreadful, dreadful winter and the deep snows delayed the divisions from advancing up into the Po Valley. Everything was about speed. Everything was about breaking through. Operation Olive, which was the operation on the East Coast, which consisted, as I've already, as already mentioned, but one Indian division, a series of British divisions, all under the command of the British Eighth Army. And this was about tempo. It was about keeping the Germans on the back foot, pushing them through, smashing their defenses. And some of the, the authors, some of the architects of this campaign, or well, this aspect of the campaign, did perhaps not think about this as carefully as they should. I've been very lucky to spend a lot of time in Italy, uh, right the way from Sicily in the south up to the north, but particularly to concentrate on the fighting in the Gothic line. And it's clear to me that above and beyond everything else, the commanders from army level down to divisional and brigade level were under dreadful political pressure to push on at all costs and to try to catch up with what was going on in Europe, not just in order to try and regain the glory to have the cameras put back on the operations in Italy, where they'd never really been in the first place, but, but to try and create this second pincer that was moving, not just second pincer on the ground, the third pincer from the air that was moving against the Reich, trying inevitably to crack into the heart of Nazi Germany. 
it was interesting, of course, that that again, my dad's experience was that he started coming up across people like one Royal Sussex, uh, second battalion of the Cameron Highlanders, British, Scottish, infantry, English infantry regiments who were saying, well, we've had the very good fortune in the fourth infantry division to be brigaded alongside the Indians. A mm. uh, very interesting point. And, and the, the, the Brits said, well, is it luck? Uh, how's this come about? And I think the the, the, the largely regular um, British, uh, here we are, here's my map, first map coming up here. You see the fighting up here towards the north of the, on the Adriatic coast of the, the Eighth Army. To get through. Second one, if we can, if we just have a quick look uh, at the Coriano map, which should be forthcoming in a moment. The next slide, please, if we can. Not to worry, it'll catch up in due course. But the impression that the British units had as they were pushing up here that belonged to the Indian divisions is that they were immensely lucky, immensely lucky to be fighting alongside Indian units. Of course, this was born in the days of the Raj of suspicions after the Indian mutiny. But now the British regulars who were alongside the Indians regarded them as being absolutely first class troops. A little bit of a map here of the Coriano Ridge. If we can move on from there, we should pick up the flash next of the 4th Indian Infantry Division. Again, it'll catch up in a moment. But the operation I want to talk about, here we are, here's 4 Div, they're coming up. We'll then see some Gurkhas from 2nd 6th Gurkha Rifles, uh, with the whole point about this being the anti-tank efforts that were made up here in Italy. The anti-tank gun and the tank, of course, were absolutely supreme in the operations in valleys that are, are, are not on the coast of Italy, are not the yawning, towering valleys that we've been seeing seen down on the Gustav line or further in along the, 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 <coughs> the, 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 the um, Gothic line, which the American Fifth Army Division were having to take but a much gentler version um, leading up towards the Adriatic coast. We should, in a moment, get some pictures of Gurkhas alongside one of their anti-tank guns. Here we come, I think. I guess think the, the runes that things are about to change, it doesn't matter if they don't. But again, the experience of Richard Hull pushing against the tide to get his armoured vehicles up quickly to smash the Germans who were dominating the Coriano Ridge further to the north of the Gothic climb. This was to be held up badly by the positions at Gimano or Gemano, people pronounce it in two different ways. Here we are, second sixth Gurkhas with a captured German anti-tank gun. And then we'll get a picture in due course of Field Marshal, he will be Field Marshal Sir Richard Hull at this stage, he's a divisional commander, who makes the extraordinary decision but because of the ground and because of the conditions that he's going to launch his armoured troops, namely the second armoured division, without any infantry support. So here we are. here's the man, here is the architect of this particular minor disaster that we're about to talk about. Um, he pushes his tanks without the Gurkha Brigade on his right flank and with only elements of the 4th Infantry Division supporting him up on the left flank at Gimano, which dominates the, the attack that he's about to put in. An extremely experienced desert armoured soldier. He's the last officer to be commissioned into the British 21st Lancers. And yet, as so often we find in the Italian campaign, that people make, it make terrible decisions time after time after time. In this case, his decision is that he sacrifices uh, that time and speed for solid preparation. Launching an unsupported uh, armour brigade, he gets himself into a desperate tangle, which the Gurkhas from 43 Brigade, the British 18th Lorried Infantry Brigade, and the Indian formations from the 4th Indian Division have to try and sort out in order to try and push on across the valley. There are a series of attacks across the, across the Coriano Valley, the next, this slide already. So this is Gurkha infantry. There, this is the, the slide that I really wanted. This shows the the platoon commander's impression of the positions that the Gurkhas on the right and the 18 Lorried Infantry Brigade are going to have to take along the Coriano Ridge. If you can imagine, 
Fourth Infantry Inf Fourth Indian Infantry Division firing from the left flank, Gurkhas to the right, 18 Brigade in the middle. This is the sort of information that the, 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 the lack of preparation from divisional level left at platoon and company level for the infantry to attack. Now, it's better than nothing, but as you fully appreciate, that is not, a, that is not an aerial photograph. That is not really a proper ordnance map. That is simply a sketch of one of the villages that the British and the Gurkhas are going to have to try and take in September 1944. The two very, very bloody attacks against this ridge line. Uh, the next slide should show them at the sort of British tank casualties. Here we are. This is up on the left flank, some Sherman tanks here. I think it's not entirely clear, but I think these are our of the reconnaissance regiment of 5060. If they could be from the 4th SARS, I'm not clear about that. But to prevent this sort of thing happening, you're meant to have infantry in support at all times. Richard Hull got this wrong. Now, it was only finally that the gallantry of the Gurkhas on the right, the gallantry of the 4th Indian Division on the left, and the 18th British, uh, British Lorried Infantry Brigade attacking in the centre, that the very difficult German positions along the top of the ridge line were taken. This, of course, only opened the gate to the further attacks down <clears throat> along to the Murano River from the Coriano Ridge, <clears throat> which eventually would come up hard against the German 98 Infantry Division, which stopped the British 8th Army, really, in its tracks, if that's not a bad pun, before the winter of 1944. The last slide, I hope we will get in a moment, which just shows, I think, how these things get so badly wrong. If you look on Google, you will see that Sher Bahada Tapa VC from the 4th Indian Infantry Division is illustrated by this gentleman here. Well, he, he's not from the 4th Division. He's from the 8th Division, as you can see. He is clearly not a Gurkha. He is a Sikh soldier. And uh, I, I feel that somehow this summarizes a lot of the confusion and the misconceptions that go on on the fighting on the Gothic line. I'll conclude by saying this. I've been delighted to be involved in this presentation. My last visit to India was in March of this year when I was studying the Sikh wars. But every time that I managed to get to Italy, I always go to the, um, to the, 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 the War Graves Commission Cemetery just below Casino. And I look at the headstones there. Not only of battalions like my father's, not only of tank regiments such as the Central India Horse, but the Gurkhas, the Sikhs, the Rajputanas, all of these various different fine Indian infantry regiments which fought alongside their British, New Zealand and other brothers, finally to achieve this great breakthrough against one of the greatest tyrannies that we, the British, the Indians, and all of the allied formations have faced so far in our history. Thank you very much for listening to me. Patrick, thank you very much indeed. That was very moving. And um, I, I wasn't aware that your father had fought in the, uh, in the campaign. But it, it, I do agree with you that going to the cemetery at the base of Casino is one of the most salutary experiences of anyone's life, because <clears throat> not only are there Brits, Australians, uh, New Zealanders, Poles, um, Brazilians, all sorts of people representing this quite extraordinary international effort that uh, Neil Barr described earlier. And um, But I think you did a really good job of just describing how uh, the, the fighting on a personal basis. It's also very interesting, actually, and this is a little segue to uh, Colonel Gareth Davis, is to, to really identify that at this late stage in the war, uh, Divisional and Corps commanders were still making some quite extraordinary mistakes, tactical mistakes and, and operational mistakes in the deployment of forces, which might seem surprising to us. But I think you made it very clear that one of the real challenges that, it, that our Divisional and the Corps commanders and indeed the Army commanders had in Italy was this political pressure to keep the offensive going. The idea that we uh, would become bogged down in this attritional type of, uh, of warfare in Italy had not been considered prior to the invasion of Sicily. And, and indeed, from the very moment our troops landed on the beaches at Salerno and Anzio, the, the, the fighting was such, and this has been very well brought out in recent books on the Italian campaign, became a, a real surprise. 
And yet one of the things that is always intriguing about the fighting in Italy was how the men kept on going. And I was delighted to hear you describe the way in which the Indians uh, maintained quite extraordinary morale through this. And, um, and Alex mentioned right at the start, for some very strange reason, the Indian um, formations, the three um, divisional formations in the 43rd Brigade in Italy, retained it, uh, remained at an all-time strength in terms of manpower at a time when British troops were uh, becoming th thin on the ground. It's very, very hard to swap out battle, <coughs> ca battle casualties in the, in the British formations, whereas it wasn't in the Indians. And not only did they retain quite significant numbers, uh, they also retained quite extraordinary morale. And remember, men of the 4th Division had been fighting, as Neil Barr said, all the way from Karen. This idea that uh, they would have lots of R&R um, and &R and they'd be able to go home to India and come back and so on, mm. it just, mm. just didn't exist. So that, that's very, very powerful. It's a real question for us today <laughs> when we consider the realities of war. How do these boys continue fighting in the way they did? It's, it's quite extraordinary. So, Patrick, thank you very much indeed. We're now going to um, last, but by no means please, hand over to Colonel Gareth Davis, who's... Uh, keeps on telling me that uh, a day without tanks is a day wasted. So we're really pleased to be able to welcome you again. And um, I, one of the am amazing things for me, actually, in the transformation, I actually, I do like using the word transmogrification because it was a, a change from something very different, to something even more different to the Indian Army. You know, in 1943-44, we had Indian soldiers who had never driven anything before. Uh, having been given armoured vehicles and be, were being mechanised. They were transferred from their horses. And horsemen don't always good, make good mechanics. They don't always make good um, uh, vehicle soldiers. And yet here in 1943-44, we have an Indian army that's been given tracks and wheels. So how on earth do they cope with that? Gareth, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Robin. Hopefully you can see my slides on the screen. Um, I think I've been set up very, very well by the um, previous speakers and by, by you and your introduction, Rob. So thank you. We've had the, the strategic uh, aspect. Um, we've had a little bit of a, uh, an intro to the versatility of the Central Indian horse from India, or sorry, from uh, Alex. And, and Patrick talked and mentioned right at the end that the, the, the great regiments of the Indian Army working alongside uh, other nations. And I'm certainly going to keep that uh, element going in the next uh, 15 minutes. So I think thank you to, to all four of you for setting the conditions very nicely. Um, just one uh, little aside, this is a military literature festival and it's quite surprising how little literature there is written about the Indian cavalry in Italy in 1943 to 1945. Um, there are some books on the histories of individual regiments, uh, some very good books. There's um, a, a series of books about the, the tigers of India, the, the three books on the uh, the three divisions, uh, and there's some work on the 43rd. But there's nothing that focuses down really on um, the reconnaissance regiment, um, which I think is a shame. And so perhaps that's given me this, this opportunity has given me my, my next project, but, but three, I think it is. Um, my story starts back in this summer, actually, when I read uh, this article in the Deccan Chronicle in, in June of this year. Um, I was slightly surprised. Uh, to read that the Indian Army is going to get its Swiss Army knives. Uh, and I'm, I'm surprised because, as far as I'm concerned, the, the subject of my um, 10, 15 minutes this morning, this afternoon, this evening, is um, the, the Indian Recce regiments in, in, in Italy in, in 43 to 45 were, to me, very much a, a Swiss Army knife. And um, I'm now going to go and talk about why I think they're a Swiss Army knife and what they did in operations, a couple of vignettes to, to show uh, what they did out there. But before I go into uh, 1943, I need to go back to 1938. This, this, this relates to what Rob was just saying about mechanisation. May 1938 is when the Indian cavalry starts to mechanise. The Indian army mechanises before that, uh, but not the cavalry. The cavalry is still on their horse, and it's the Sims horse who first give up their horses. And the other regiments follow sweet, suit uh, pretty sharpish, but the key point uh, to take from from this is that the three regiments I'm going to talk about, Skinner's horse, um, the Duke of Connaught's or the Six Lancers, I'll probably refer to them, uh, and the Central Indian horse, they hadn't been mechanised very long before they headed off to war in, in certainly 1939, 1940, uh, and 1941. That road to war for those three regiments, and uh, the road to war in Italy, is, is a twisty road. 
it, it's twisty in terms of organization, structure, equipment, training, doctrine. And it's twisty in terms of the actions they fought. I might touch on them in passing. Um, but the, the, the main point I want to bring out before we get into the detail is that there was a very different approach between the Indian infantry divisions and the British infantry divisions in how they approached reconnaissance. At the start of the war, the British infantry divisions theoretically had an armor corps of tank, uh, equipped with tanks, um, but they were soon stripped out of the infantry divisions. And it wasn't until the beginning of 1944 that the British infantry divisions got uh, reconnaissance corps regiments. Most of those reconnaissance corps regiments that went to the British infantry divisions were infantry battalions that had converted. One or two were, were, were the divisional anti-tank companies, brought, sorry, brigade anti-tank companies brought together uh, and formed into a regiment. The Indians took a different route. The Indian Army took <coughs> their cavalry regiments and put them into the reconnaissance role. And I, I've done a little bit of reconnaissance. I'm mainly a heavy tank man. But from my perspective as a heavy tank man, I think the Indians made the right decision because I think the cavalryman comes with a mindset, if properly equipped, that he can um, execute that role for the divisional commander, perhaps more so uh, than an infantry battalion. There are infantrymen uh, listening into me who might disagree. Um, sorry, I, I, I just got ahead of myself. Um, first interaction, Skinner's horse in 1940, followed by Central India horse, who 80 years ago today were supporting um, 4th Indian Division in North Africa, just up on the, the Egyptian-Libyan border as part of Op Compass. And, and actually, 4th Indian Division had been in uh, action in, in December with my old regiment, the Royal Tank Regiment, in particular the 7th Battalion. Um, Skinner's go... Um, off to North Africa. It's going to start in Sudan uh, in East Africa in 1940. They do end up in North Africa before they go off to, to Italy. Central India horse, not long in, in, in North Africa. They go to Sudan, Syria. They're back to North Africa, Iraq, Tunisia. And then they arrive in late 43, early 44 with the 4th India Division in Italy. Six Lancers have also been in the Middle East um, in Iraq and they arrive in Italy in about October 1943. So all three regiments have been doing quite a bit in a number of places. And so they are theoretically quite experienced, notwithstanding the fact that they have only uh, mechanised uh, soon before that. So back to my Swiss Army knife. Why do I call it a Swiss Army knife? Well, let's have a quick look at the structure. I'm not going to go through the whole uh, regiment, but there are a number of bits and pieces I think are important to bring out. Um, all three regiments have a very similar structure. There are some one or two subtle differences. And essentially, it's three sabre squadrons and a headquarters squadron. I've left all the administrative uh, elements out. But if you add in all the administrative elements uh, and the three sabre squadrons and the headquarters squadron, this is about 600 men strong. These are large organisations. And I think they've got, because of the, the, the way in which they're organised, a large number of capabilities. Um, Com group with Humber scout cars, that uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, the support troop is quite interesting. Uh, on the left-hand side, I've got Skinners with the uh, an armoured car, an AEC armoured car um, with a six-pounder gun. But below it, we've got um, half-tracks with a 75mm gun. These are not artillery guns, although they are now here showing sort of semi-indirect fire. Roll. These are anti-tank uh, guns. So these are tank destroyers, um, which is quite interesting. Um, we've then got uh, the mortar troop. Uh, mortar troop, um, uh, that's actually a two-inch mortar. I think some of them had a three-inch mortar as well. Um, but they do. there are accounts of them firing that two-inch mortar in the direct uh, fire roll, uh, because quite a lot of the fighting, certainly up in the north of Italy, was at pretty short range. Looking across the right-hand side, uh, we've got the, the mainstay is the, the scout troop, uh, the, the armoured car troop in the squadron. Um, that's, I think, on an otter armoured car at the top. Uh, and below it's a dingo. Um, the um, carrier troop uh, in the um, Bren gun carrier, universal carrier, fairly obvious, two of those. Um, the jeep troop, the six lancers, DCO didn't have one of those. Uh, they had some additional um, uh, lorries uh, to keep them going. And then at the bottom, the rifle troop, just look at the size of that. That's 36, that's a rifle platoon. So we've got support weapons. We've got anti-tank guns, we've got armoured cars for scouting, we've got carriers for moving around, and we've got quite a lot of lorries. And so that is why, to me, I say that these are very much uh, a Swiss Army knife. And, and I, I started off thinking about the you know, jack-of-all-trades uh, analogy, but that's unfair, because 
Jack of all trades is generally followed by the master of none. These guys were masters. And so that's why I think that the, the Swiss Army knife works slightly better uh, as an analogy. Masters of what? Well, um, I'm just going to put the map up. That's the map we saw from, from, from Neil earlier, uh, just to remind ourselves where uh, the various uh, formations were at the various points in time as we go through. And now I'm going to go and talk about um, what I think are the, the four key roles of divisional recce, to gain, to deny, to deceive, and to exploit. Those are not doctrinal terms. Those are, those are mine, borrowed from, from somebody else. And I'm going to go and use a little vignette of action in Italy to show how uh, these Div Recce regiments uh, undertook those roles. And the first up is gain. Clearly, that's the, the, the core task of any uh, reconnaissance organisation. And it's what all of these three regiments had been trained to do on horseback. Um, six Lancers, uh, the Duke of Connaught's own, uh, they're in action soon after they arrive in uh, Italy. And by November uh, 1943, the, 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 the regiment is spread across the whole divisional front of about uh, 20 miles across the front of the 8th Indian Division. And they start deep patrolling on foot. Um, one of these patrols managed to take a couple of German prisoners. And on questioning them, uh, they discovered that there were some uh, more Germans uh, in a village called Rosello, which was at the time about four miles behind uh, enemy lines and about eight miles away from uh, the Indian Liga. So they sent a 12-man patrol out at dawn um, to confirm the enemy position and, and if possible, to capture a, a prisoner. Patrol went out, got about five miles, uh, and they were lying up in a wood uh, when some German cavalry appeared on horseback. Uh, I wonder whether the, 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 um, the, the six Lancers sort of looked slightly uh, wistfully at, at these horses considering they were doing a dismounted patrol. Uh, but the Germans moved off, uh, and the, the, the six Lancers pushed on into the village. They got to the village about half past three in the afternoon, uh, and they walked down the main street, and, and they, there's no evidence of Germans around. So they started peering into the windows. And uh, one of the houses they came to, they spotted a group of Germans sat around a table having a cup of tea. And as they were just thinking about what to do, one of these ger a cup pair of Germans walked out of the front door, hands in pockets very nonchalantly. So they shot one of them immediately, uh, which spurred the second one to, to, to surrender immediately. Uh, a grenade was thrown through the door, tea party obviously disturbed, and the patrol left uh, with, their, um, couple, uh, with their prisoner uh, who was taken back. And, and um, actually the patrol commander, uh, a, a young officer, was awarded the military cross for action, that action. So here we have them, cavalrymen who were on horses, who are now equipped with scout cars, armoured cars, conducting dismounted recce. Um, so straight away, we've got some versatility. Um, next task, deny. Denying the enemy uh, access to your own positions, keeping the enemy at bay. And um, my favourite story that for, for this is to do with the, the Central India horse. And um, some of you will have read the book, um, The Tiger Triumphs by Stevens. And, and he he talks about uh, a situation where he has a cross-section of the United Nations um, taking part in an operation to build a road. Um, we've got work being covered by the Central India Horse. They've pushed out uh, pickets up into the hills. Uh, they've also created false positions and, and false emplacements to, to deceive, uh, to confuse the enemy. But their main role is denial. And uh, down on the ground, you've got Italian labourers, uh, British sappers, uh, Canadian sappers, all being uh, protected by Indian cavalrymen. Um, the success of uh, the Central Indian Horse in keeping uh, the Germans at bay was clearly um, quite an uh, quite excitement for one of the squadron leaders, um, Major Patterson, because um, as soon as the road that, that they had been guarding had been built, he and a sapper officer uh, jumped in a jeep and set off to a village called Palazzo di, P di Pero. Um, it was hard going. They had a man handle the jeep quite a lot of the way. And about two miles short of that um, village, uh, they found that they could get no further. So they grabbed from the back of the Jeep a couple of collapsible motorbikes, scooters, um, that, uh, as issued to Paris, and off they set uh, on uh, these scooters and got to the village where they met up with um, a New Zealand armoured car patrol uh, coming the other way. And again, I like to think, you know, Major Patterson, uh, a cavalry officer, uh, seeing that opportunity to push on and took it. My third task, deceive, deception. And it, it's another account which ties in with the sappers, uh, and this is from um, May 1944. 
Sanford's were building one of the many, many bridges they built. Um, I, I mean, if you if you really want to uh, read uh, about hard work in the Italian campaign, um, the Sappers is an area to investigate. But the Sappers building uh, one of their bridges and building a Bailey Bridge is noisy work. It's, it's a very specific noise. It's metal on metal. Um, and there's very little that can be done to hide that noise. You, you can't deaden it with, with material. So the alternative is to, to, to confuse the Germans as to where the uh, bridging site was. And um, the six Lancers found themselves up in the Lurie Valley um, taking part in a deception exercise. And so whilst the bridge was being built um, down over the Lurie, uh, a patrol of the six Lancers was um, further up the, at the valley, banging metal stakes, um, clanging metal on metal, banging pickets and hammers together to create the noise of a bridge being built. Um, the Germans were taken in by it. Um, six Lancers were shelled quite uh, considerably during the day. Um, whereas the real bridge site was generally left alone. And so, again, use of deception by the, the cavalrymen. I get that cavalry mindset to me coming up with ideas to, to confuse the Germans helped. Uh, and the final task is exploitation. And um, uh, my example for this is up in the Tiber Valley in, in July of 44, uh, when um, 10th Indian Division had a whole heap of high ground north of Perugia, uh, and that allowed for a small exploitation task through uh, the Tiber Valley. Uh, clearly, after uh, the fall of uh, in 45, there's a great deal of exploitation. But I, I want to look at this one uh, because, again, it's multinational. And Patrick talked about this, this, this working together. Skinner's Horse are, are operating with the Third Hussars, who are on tanks, and the Royal Wiltshire Yeomanry, who are on tanks. And you don't get many accounts of British recce regiments working with British armoured regiments. And um, I think this comes about that the Indian um, recce regiments working with tanks because, again, they come from this cavalry back. Now, I may have got that wrong. I may have put an assertion out there that, that is not backed up in evidence. It's an area I need to look at. But having just read through some of the detail this week, it, it, I believe that to be true. Um, exploitation isn't always done at haste. Uh, the countryside there is, 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 is very enclosed. Vineyards and fruit trees and, 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 and limited visibility. And so um, progress was pretty slow. And um, coming through the vineyards, they were coming up, coming up against um, German defences at very short ranges. There was a, a description of one German anti-tank gun being destroyed at a range of about 10 yards. But what they found was that the, the tanks and armoured cars were actually a very good combination. Tanks, to some extent, drawing fire. Sherman tank is, 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 is quite a high beast. Um, and that then allowed the men from Skinner's Horse to perhaps manoeuvre around uh, the German position uh, and exploit forward. And the cameramen um, weren't constrained by the need to find, fix and destroy every single German position. This cavalry mindset told them they needed to kick on. Uh, and that's what they did. And, and so those are my four vignettes just to, 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 to highlight what uh, the regiments are up to. I just want to finish with a word on, on bravery of two men. And um, this is a small memorial that um, if you didn't know it there, it was there in the village of Montezzi. Um, you wouldn't see it. It's the sort of thing in the square you go and have a look at uh, deliberately. It's uh, a memorial to three men, um, Lieutenant Sinjin uh, Graham Young, Sawa Ditto Ram and Sawa Niru Chand. And um, the three men found themselves as part of a patrol read, led by uh, Lieutenant Young, who was a Royal Tank Regiment officer, as it happens, in a German minefield in the dark. Um, Ram had a leg blown off. Uh, but that didn't stop him crawling to the aid of one of his uh, fellow patrol members. He gave that other patrol member uh, first aid before Ram himself lost consciousness uh, and died soon after. Um, it's not dissimilar what happened to, to Lieutenant Young. He also had a, a leg badly damaged by a mine, and he too didn't stop. He managed to get a messenger uh, to go back uh, to bridge lines to get help, and he managed to comfort the patrol, keeping them still, uh, and talking to them for, for a number of hours whilst they waited for help. Help came, um, but sadly, Lieutenant Young died on the way to hospital. And both um, Sawa Ram and, and, and Lieutenant Young uh, were posthumously awarded uh, the George Cross uh, for their actions. And, and this rather little lovely uh, memorial, uh, the photo actually came from, from Tom Holland, uh, the historian, so thank you to him. So in conclusion, um, I'm suggesting that, that the three divisional recce regiments, the cavalry regiments of Skinner's Horse first, uh, six Duke of Hornets and Lancers, 
uh, and the central Indian horse, sometimes known as the 21st, were the, the Swiss army knife of the Indian army in the Second World War in Italy. And I'm, I'm very firmly of the opinion, but the start point of using a cavalry regiment, albeit one that had only just given up its horses, was a very sound starting point uh, and helped them considerably. Thank you. Well, Gareth, you've completely persuaded me. Uh, and, 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 and isn't it interesting when, when you think about that interaction between um, the cavalry and your your um, your Swiss Army knife, and these boys who are used to thinking about manoeuvre and thinking about moving left and right and and exploiting beyond the main positions, and then there's this big magnet to the Germans of those Sherman tanks. And it's it's no wonder, you know, when you're lying in a position, you see these Germans coming, you're going to focus on them. And that then allows the opportunity for, for our cavalry to do what they're exceptionally good at. We are right on time. In fact, we're running out of time. I don't think we're going to have uh, any uh, time to open this up to our, our audience around the world. So I think what I'll do is I'll just try, it's going to be impossible for me to sum up. I'm going to first of all start by saying, Thank you. That was absolutely scintillating. It was fascinating. It was great to be able to relate the strategic and the operational to the, the lives of the men who, at the end of the day, were forced to fight that war and, and do so with quite uh, an extraordinary degree of courage and, and even chutzpah. We need to remember this is 1945. The world had been at war for nearly six years and the Indians who had been deployed, particularly from the 4th Division, had been deployed since late 1939. And it wasn't over because, of course, the war in the Far East was still carrying on. And the extraordinary thing, I think, when I think about the Italian campaign, and I, I read a really good book um, recently on the Italian campaign. In fact, there are three standout books, I think, on the campaign. And one of the, the, the thoughts that came to me was that at the end of this, those three Indian divisions and the 43rd Lorried Infantry Brigade were given orders to go back to the Far East, because of course we had Operation Zipper and Operation Mailfist, the invasion of Malaya, Singapore, preceding the invasion of Japan in 1946 on the cards. They were invited back. It's quite an extraordinary thing to think about that at the end of this fighting, uh, this terrible fighting in Italy, those um, Indian divisions and the 43rd Brigade were going to um, pack up their kit, get on those ships and head back to the Far East. Uh, fortunately, you know that's not how the story ended. Um, well, I'm going to um, draw stumps there. I'm going to thank each of you in turn for a fascinating uh, uh, insights into the campaign in Italy. Thank you very much to uh, everyone who's been listening around the world, those in Chandigarh and further afield. It's been great having you on board today. Um, I think the challenge for all of us, well, for someone on the panel perhaps, is to write a, a new story of the Indian divisions in Italy. It would be an extraordinary story. It's something that uh, come on, all you Indian scholars need to be thinking about um, uh, in, in, term, in terms of your next project, because uh, I know the boys in the Far East all thought they were part of the 14th Army. Well, we've heard today that the um, the troops in uh, in Italy consider themselves uh, forgotten as well and quite rightly and thank you very much to the organizers in Chandigarh for your magnificent efforts in setting up this this festival and for allowing us to enjoy it all so much so thank you very much everyone and good afternoon or good night or good morning wherever you might be listening to us thank you thank you thank you very much thank you